Yes, thank you. Good morning. Um, I'm Philipp Denzel, and this is my colleague Stefan Brunner. And together we want to show you how one might go about certifying AI-based systems. Um, we present uh, our work that we did in, within an InnoSwiss project um, at ZHW uh, together with our implementation partner, Certex, a certification company. Our outline today is split into four parts, um, with the main parts being us explaining the certification scheme to you, and then we'll also walk through an example use case in which uh, we walk you through um, our methodology. So AI right now is, uh, there's quite a hype around AI um, re, uh, in the last couple of years, and expectations of AI don't always, always match its capabilities in the real world. Um, here you see a comical interpretation of this on the left side, and on the right side, a self-definition which lists some of these um, uh, capabilities. Um, but for certification, a uh, definition is actually not that important. What we have to do is clearly define what we expect from AI, um, and also know how it will behave when we put it in a certain environment. Um, this also con uh, um, includes knowing about its weaknesses, because if we don't know about its weaknesses um, and deploy a poorly understood model in the real world, it can have negative impact uh, to society and um, individuals. Here you see two examples, uh, or pictures about two examples, uh, which, uh, in which AI models were deployed and un um, behaved unexpectedly. And the authorities were not able to, um, in time, predict um, when this happened. So what do I mean with misbehavior? There are lots of examples that I could show. Um, on the left side, we have an LLM that, pre that um, leaks sen sensitive data when, pro uh, when a certain phrase is pro um, included in its prompt. Uh, on the right side, an image-based system, uh, classification system, where a, um, a, a bit of noise in the image triggers a misclassification. These and many other examples are the motivation for the regulation of AI-based systems that are deployed uh, in the real world. Actually, all all safety critical uh, systems have to be um, regulated that are put uh, out into the public. But um, the special thing about AI um, regulations is that they're explicitly um, based on ethical principles that are summarized under the term trustworthy AI. Um, we have uh, principles like robustness and safety that are more uh, common in also other sectors, um, transparency, but also fairness and many more that you see here. And the um, most comprehensive form of these regulations being um, implemented is the EU AI Act, as already mentioned. Um, it was um, accepted just late last year and will come into force by 2026. So if you're a company that wants to deploy uh, AI products in the EU space, you will have to you will have to uh, comply with the EU AI Act by that time. And Switzerland is also expected to follow shortly with uh, a very similar set of uh, um, uh, regulations. So the, um, since the inception of the EU AI Act, publications on the legal side of things con uh, about the A AI Act, responsible AI or AI reg regulations increased. On the, on the other side, the academic field, uh, with lots of publications in the technical field um, about explainable AI and responsible AI are also many. But they don't necessarily connect all the way back to the legal aspects that um, these, uh, these uh, works uh, talk about. So there seems to be a disconnect between the technical field and regulations, a gap. And this is the motivation for our project, um, where we try to develop a methodology that starts uh, the legislation 
that um, puts out uh, requirements for AI-based systems. Um, from these, we extract um, objectives that have to be fulfilled so that um, we, it, by means of compliance, and these means of compliance can um, be verified through methods, technical methods or processes that you have to implement in this uh, methodology. So, um, just as uh, the EU AI Act, our uh, methodology is rooted in these uh, dimensions for trustworthy AI. Um, but in, in our uh, project, we tested uh, and verified our method methodology on real-world use cases uh, that we implemented with third-party companies um, that have asked to be, remain um, anonymous at the moment. Um, so we have uh, gathered a lot of um, um, assessment tools uh, and verified that they will work with within our certification scheme, which Stefan will now talk about more in, in more detail. Thank you. Now I will explain you the certification scheme, which consists of four parts. The first one is the legislation, which is defined by the EU AI Act. And then we define objectives in order to comply with the legislation. And the means of compliance and methods are, are there to show the compliance with the objectives on a technical low, le um, on a technical low level. And first, the EU AI Act defines seven trustworthiness dimensions. And in our certification scheme, we consider it the robustness and safety dimension and the transparency dimension. The robustness and safety dimension refers to the consistent and functional safe behavior of the AI component, while the transparency relates to the comprehensibility of the decision of the AI function. And the certification scheme is derived from the legislation of the EU AI Act. And the EU AI Act uses a risk-based approach and defines different risk levels. And based on these risk levels, different legal obligations arise. In our certification scheme, we focused on the limited and high-risk application, which typically are autonomous driving or generative AI. In order to show the compliance with the legis legislation, we defined objectives, which, refined by, uh, which are refined by different standards and guidelines, and we analyzed 38 documents in total. It is important to mention that the objectives are typically specified for a specific trustworthiness dimension. As you can see here, for example, we included 29 transparency objectives and 44 reliability objectives. And there you can see two examples of these objectives. And it is also important, an important note that our certification scheme helps us to guide us to, this uh, to these four parts. And based on these objectives, we included a set of means of compliance to show the compliance with the defined objectives. And the means of compliance typically included processes, documentation, criteria metrics, which are mostly quantitative or qualitative, and algorithms and methods. And diving deeper into the technical methods, we added 95 in total. And we also assess the methods on benchmark data sets and state-of-the-art models in order to select the most suitable methods. In order to keep trace of the link from the objectives to the methods, we use the Gyro tool since it wouldn't be possible to keep trace of it with other tools. And this tool also added uh, the value of filtering options, where we can filter 
for example, for specific dimensions or methods, and this will help us to guide us through the complete certification process. And we also included taxonomies for the selection of suitable methods, where we assessed on several bench of benchmark data sets and state-of-the-art models. Last but not least, we applied our certification scheme on a use case, and we work together with companies, and therefore we, apl and therefore we applied our certification scheme on on two use cases that were confidential, but we replicated the complete workflow and applied it on a scientific use case. As you can see here, we want to detect or classify benign and malignant skin lesions, and therefore an assistant captures an image of the skin lesion, while the AI system processes the image and decides of the treatment. The physician only interrupts if he sees something went, uh, went very badly wrong. And based on this scenario, we would consider it a high-risk application, since a, misclassifica since a misclassification could lead to physical harm. And therefore, we had a need for this certification. And for this certification, we would mainly focus the reliability or transparency. Now we take a deeper look into the reliability dimension. So in the EU AI Act, it is referred as robust and safety, but we extended it to reliability in general, where we want the consistent behavior and we want also the robustness aspects, for example, the consistent behavior under any circumstances. This would refer to perturbations or other scenarios. And therefore, the reliability also considers the data coverage, the robustness and uncertainty. Now we're going to take a look in two aspects of the reliability dimension, which is the data coverage and robustness. And we added two objectives and two means of compliance for this purpose. So the first one for the data coverage would be the data coverage of the operational design domain. And the operational design domain typically refers to the area of the input space uh, where where every perturbation and scenario is included. And for this ODD, our AI system should be reliable and robust. And the means of compliance to achieve the data coverage would be the simulation of the relevant perturbations. While for the robustness objectives, we typically want to show robust behavior against any kind of perturbation of the operational design domain and its means of compliance would be perform a robustness test. And now the next dimension, the transparency, will continue, Philip. Thank you. So um, for transparency, um, the most important thing is uh, that the um, AI model is, uh, the decisions of the AI system is comprehensible. Um, uh, typically, one def first defines the stakeholders that are involved in or affected in the decisions that the AI model uh, takes. Um, and um, for each stakeholder, an explanation, an appropriate explanation is um, selected. This often, these uh, explanations can pertain to the data, the model behavior as a whole, or for just single inputs. Um, and these are usually uh, called global or local explanations. And with explana explanations, we mean in this case, um, what features in the data actually caused, uh, or the model caused uh, a certain decision that the AI model took. In our example, um, we, we can through, uh, run through multiple objectives. One of them is provide the physician with explanation what led to a malignant classification. Our scheme then um, 
points us to means of compliance, which is the pr uh, providing a local explanation. In this case, this is appropriate. Um, these explanations can have several form. For image-based systems, those often are also uh, pictorial. Um, we can use saliency maps, attention maps, uh, or a methods uh, um, like SHAP, um, where um, the, the input image um, shows us uh, relevant features, uh, relevant pixels um, in, in the image um, that led to a decision. In the left case, we see that there's a um, feature on the left corner, lower left corner, that uh, contributed to the decision of it uh, classifying it as malignant. Of course, um, as we, if we look at the image, it, we see a hair, and so it's most likely not the case that, in this, uh, that this is actually a malignant lesion. On the right side, we see a true classification um, with a slightly um, different um, explainer within SHAP, where um, the, the region that is actually relevant for the classification is highlighted. So in summary, we, our methodology um, starts from the uh, regulations, um, provides objectives that we have to fulfill uh, through means of compliance, and we can test these uh, through uh, technical methods like these uh, that we showed here or uh, Stefan showed before. So, in summary, we saw a problem, and, uh, and this problem being the gap between the reg regulations uh, and the technical assessment um, of AI-based systems, and our um, project contributed contributed by building a methodology that is uh, generally applicable in the real world and that guides you through um, a certification process. So far we have looked at um, lots of different objectives, means of compliance, metrics and methods that we verified would be appropriate for uh, our methodology and the certification as a whole and um, tested these on real world use cases. We have we're still in the process of uh, refining our methodology, and in the future we will implement more safety and human uh, control objectives uh, to um, cover the entire uh, requirements that are uh, covered by the EU AI Act. Now, in our in the preparation of our methodology, we noticed that there's definitely a need from the research community to, um, for, for more appropriate uh, metrics for certification. So this is uh, very important uh, to have appropriate metrics, and so far we have uh, sampled a few, but uh, we could always do with more. And for the industry partners in the room, our take-home message is prepare now before the EU AI Act comes into force. Because even if you don't have uh, business within the EU space, um, Switzerland is expected to follow uh, with uh, the same or similar set of requirements uh, in a short time period. And as, as self-advertisement, our framework provides a guidance through this certification process. So if you're interested in a project, uh, building up a project with us, come to any of us that um, you might see in the audience or to us and contact, contact us. Thank you. Is it on? Yes, so thanks a lot. Question, so how much of this is uh, validated legally, right? So you say kind of eventually you have 95 different methods to apply. Do I need to do that from a legal point of view or maybe 10 would be enough? Because there's always a tension between <coughs> being very sure that I'm compliant, but also this comes with a significant effort. Yes. If you have a kind of 10 use cases a week to go through this, uh, you know, this is gonna cost quite a bit. So, um, 
our methodology is based on standards. At the moment, these standards don't really guarantee that if you follow these standards, you will comply with the EU AI Act uh, regulations. However, um, the um, EU commissioned um, the development of uh, sta harmonized standards that will eventually guarantee if you follow the standards, you will comply. So um, this, um, as, as I said, the, the EU, AI, EU AI Act becomes active uh, uh, comes into force by 2026. So it's still a development process up to that point. Um, but once we've integrated these harmonized um, uh, standards, following this methodology will actually guarantee that you will, um, we will comply with the regulations. I see I'm going to get fit today. <laughs> On the example that you showed, uh, the system that uh, analyzes the skin legion, I mean, such a system would also be have would also have to be certified as a medical device, and so there seems to be quite an overlap. Have you thought about that? So yes, um, o obviously, lots of uh, safety critical uh, applications will already have uh, regulations put into uh, place uh, before the EU AI Act, but. If your uh, model, uh, if your system contains um, the uh, um, an AI model, you have to comply with these regulations. Maybe they're not even that uh, so strict, uh, um, uh, less strict than um, medical regulations that are already in place. So uh, maybe this is not even a problem that you have to think about in the medical space. Uh, but uh, anyways. Um, if you have an AI model, you will have to show that you comply with these regulations, no matter in what field you are. As long as it's a high-risk uh, application. Are there other questions? So we mostly, we mostly added AI-related ISO norms and other documents in order to derive our objectives. And I think for medical devices, you would also need to comply with specific medical documentation, ISO norms, for example. Other questions? If not, I, I might have one question. Um, <clears throat> I'm wondering if you've put maybe a thought into the idea that we're trying to re regulate on a black box, which is obviously making it extremely difficult, and the more powerful the algorithm becomes, the more black box it becomes, and whether we shouldn't be taking a step back and looking more towards the idea that we uh, change the way we're making the models in the first place so that they are naturally more more easily uh, regulable or w have regulation with respect to them. Because at the moment, it seems that we're putting a lot of effort to do this backward uh, process. And I'm wondering if we shouldn't be using a forward process more. Do you want to come? Um, I have to um, so at the moment, I think at the moment, um, at the moment, we added methodologies to assess the white box and black box model. But, uh, but as you mentioned, for example, for high-risk application, it won't be sufficient if you use a black box model or if you only have the black box access um, for this model, then it wouldn't be sufficient to show the compliance. For example, for the transparency, you would have a lot of problems. Thank you. Yes. Yeah, right. so ideally, we would have to actually take a step, uh, step back, yeah. but um, AI is prevalent right now and you can't do anything about yeah. this. And just an add-on, I'm also part of the project team, so one of our objectives is that before you take a black box model, you have to really consider if you need one or if it's better to take an interpretable, transparent model, a simpler model. So this is also one of our objectives. Thank you for the answer. Thank you very much to Stefan Philipp. Uh, maybe another round of applause for an excellent talk.